Our final speaker is Dr. James Grebel, who served as the museum's archivist as well as associate curator of research provenance and archives, and has recently been appointed the museum's docent manager. Formerly a teacher of art history at San Diego State University and classicist from UCLA, Dr. Grebel selected the works of ancient Greek and Roman art for the art of music and contributed the essay, The Power of Music in Classical Myth and Art for the catalog. His paper today concerns the figure of Orpheus and the complex powers of music that he embodied. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Grebel. Like Michael, in, in a way, I'm presenting some supplementary material. The, the objects I'll be looking at were not in the exhibition, but they um, certainly um, complement some of the things that are in the exhibition. Um, several of the previous speakers this afternoon, uh, or this morning, uh, presented images of Orpheus, the great uh, legendary musician of antiquity. And that's the subject of my talk. The legendary Thracian bard Orpheus, the quintessential musician of Greco-Roman antiquity, was a complex and paradoxical figure. Although the ancients viewed him as the most important human in the development of music, he came on the scene relatively late and his mythology was full of contradictions, suggesting a conflation of several different personalities. Early references to him in Greek literature are quite scanty. His name is completely absent, for instance, from the earliest Greek literary sources, the epic poetry of Homer and of Hesiod, whose works probably date to the 8th century BC. The first known mention of Orpheus came in the mid 6th century BC when a fragmentary verse by the lyric poet Ibicus referred to him succinctly as Orpheus of famous name without any further elaboration. From roughly the same time as the poem by Ibicus comes the first surviving visual depiction of Orpheus carved on a now fragmentary metope of the Sicyonian treasury at Delphi dated about 570 to 550 BC. The metope, which is a limestone slab cut in high relief, shows several of the crew of the Argo, including the Dioscuri on horseback, who flank the left and right sides, and this figure on the right of Orpheus, who's identified by the lyre that he holds and by an inscription on the metope. This is the only known depiction of Orpheus the Argonaut in ancient art. But though the visual expression of this tradition appears to have been quite limited, it was much more widely known in the literature. In fact, the earliest known substantive mention of Orpheus in poetry also dealt with his role as one of the Argonauts, though it was written a full century after the Sicyonian metope was carved. The source for this mention was the lyric poet Pindar, who, in enumerating the crew of the Argo in his fourth Pythian ode, wrote, quote, and from Apollo, the lyre player, came the father of songs, much praise Orpheus, end quote. A salient point of Pindar's statement is that Orpheus came from Apollo. His association of the bard with the god Apollo and his circle clearly reflected early Greek thought. The first writers to address Orpheus's origins state that he was in fact the son of the muse Calliope, either by the Thracian king Oegrus or by Apollo himself. It was said that Apollo gave Orpheus the lyre and that his mother Calliope who was the chief of the nine muses and presided over epic poetry and eloquence, taught him to play and sing. Orpheus's origins explain much of his later narrative. From Apollo and Calliope, he inherited or learned such skill with his voice and lyre that he could charm both gods and nature. As Aeschylus said in his Agamemnon of the mid fifth century BC, quote, he led all things by the rapture of his voice. And a decade later, 
Euripides specified in the Bacchae that Orpheus, quote, drew together trees by his songs and drew together the beasts of the fields, end quote. Later sources, such as the Argonautica by Apollonius Rhodius, written in the first half of the third century BC, and the Fabulae of Hyginus, compiled near the end of the first century BC, elaborated on the power of Orpheus's music to enchant deities, mortal men, wild beasts, and to make the very rocks and trees move. Curiously, the literary references to Orpheus' charming nature apparently weren't reflected in depictions on Greek pottery, but the theme was used to decorate a number of Etruscan bronze mirrors, such as this one from Viterbo in Italy, made about 400 to 350 BC, and I know this is very hard to see, but there's an image here of the lyre being held by Orpheus, and scattered about him are various wild animals. The association of Orphic imagery with mirrors may be related to the cult of Orphism, which developed in the fifth century BC. In Orphic theogonies, that is, accounts of the origins of the gods, the Titans murdered the divine child Zagreus, who was then reborn as the god Dionysus. Some ancient writers credited Orpheus with the invention of the mysteries of Dionysus and the dissemination of his cult, a notion which we'll revisit in a few moments. Depictions of Orpheus' charming nature are much more common on Roman floor mosaics, of which scores are known, widely dispersed throughout the Roman world, from Turkey and Syria to North Africa, France, and Britain. This example from Palermo, Sicily, dated about AD 200 to 250, is typical. The designers of these mosaics often reveled in depicting a veritable zoo of exotic animals and usually included rocks and a tree, perhaps alluding to Orpheus's ability to cause inanimate nature to follow him, rather like the Pied Piper. Like the Etruscan mirrors, these mosaics were very often linked with Orphism, as were the class of works which referred to Orpheus's descent into the underworld. One of the most dramatic demonstrations of the power of Orpheus's music occurred on his journey to the underworld to retrieve his dead wife, Eurydice. After Orpheus charmed his way past Charon, the boatman and the guardian Cerberus, he then won Eurydice's return to life by enchanting Hades and Persephone, the rulers of the underworld, with his song. This tale received great attention in ancient literature from Euripides, Plato, Apollodorus, Hyginus, Ovid, and many other writers. But it seems to have had very limited expression in ancient art. One prominent example was this marble, I'm sorry, a marble relief carved about 440 to 420 BC by the renowned Greek sculptor Alcamenes, a pupil of the great Phidias. The original work has long been lost, but its appearance is known through six ancient copies scattered in various museums in Rome, Naples, and Paris. Briefly, these reliefs show the tragic moment when the god Hermes is about to return Eurydice to the underworld after Orpheus violated Hades' strict instructions not to glance back while leading her to the land of the living. Thus, the potency of Orpheus's enchanting music was undone by his own human frailty, perhaps foreshadowing the coming paradox of his own death. As far as we know, the story of Orpheus and Eurydice was not depicted elsewhere in art until it began to appear in the fourth century BC on vases from the Greek areas of southern Italy, particularly Apulia. Generally, these depictions don't actually show Orpheus leading Eurydice from the underworld or Hermes taking her back, but only Orpheus's musical performance before Hades and Persephone. Even then, 
Orpheus is not a central figure in the composition, but merely an adjunct to a hectic assembly of famous denizens of the underworld, including Sisyphus, Ixion, Tantalus, and others. This spectacular volute crater by the underworld painter, dated about 330 to 320 BC and now in Munich, exemplifies the type. It's interesting that in later periods, beginning with the Renaissance, Orpheus's abortive attempt to rescue Eurydice from the underworld came to be the most famous of all his exploits, spawning numerous pictorial works, such as Corot's painting Orpheus and Eurydice featured in this exhibition, as well as several musical compositions and even a film or two. Another important aspect of Orpheus's mythology that featured prominently in ancient literature was the power that his music had over humans. And it was this facet that was depicted on a large number of red figure vases made in Attica, Greece, during the fifth century BC. While the writers offered different versions of the story, the vase painters largely seem to have embraced the variant in which Orpheus enthralled the men of Thrace with his music. Orpheus himself was a native of Thrace, a wild, mountainous region on the northern border of Greece, considered a barbaric foreign land by the Greeks. But the vase painters rarely gave him the distinctive garb of the Thracians, treating him instead like a Greek. After his adventures with the Argonauts and his journey to the underworld, Orpheus returned to his home country where he established religious rites and attracted a large following of men through his enchanted playing and singing. Vases like this column crater, the name vase of the Orpheus painter, made around 440 BC, depict the bard surrounded by several men identified as Thracians by their exotic caps and cloaks, who are listening intently to the magical sounds, some with their eyes closed, others with looks of rapture on their faces. And you can see this gentleman has his eyes closed. He's sort of leaning over pensively. The other two on the right are staring very intently at Orpheus as he sings. This pelique by the Cleophon painter, now in the British Museum and dated about a decade later than the Berlin crater we just viewed, is a smaller example of the type with only two Thracian men flanking Orpheus. These two vases from Berlin and London represent scores of other vessels, many fragmentary, decorated with the same theme during the fifth century BC. An unusual variant of the type hints at the climax of this story. This crater by the painter of London, E497, depicts Orpheus in his usual pose, though he's displaced to the left, while a Thracian man in the center speaks to a Thracian woman who is holding a sickle, an ominous object. It's what Lessing might have called a pregnant moment, when the action is arrested, but the viewer knows what will follow. The Thracian women, incensed because Orpheus was distracting their men from their work and from their conjugal duties, or in some versions, because he rejected the women's sexual advances, or even because he introduced homosexual love to Thrace, the women will kill Orpheus, then castrate and dismember him and throw his head into the river. While the Metropolitan's crater we just viewed only hints at Orpheus's grisly end, more than 60 vases, surviving vases, uh, actually depict his murder by enraged women. As in this early example from about 470 to 460 BC by the Oenocles painter, now in the British Museum, many of these depictions show Orpheus attacked by women wielding spears and sometimes long skewers or spits, like the one that has been run through his body here, blood running down his side and his abdomen. 
As he attempts to flee, Orpheus turns to look back at his attacker, extending his arm in a gesture begging for clemency. This is a stock gesture used in Greek painting. The painters of this type of vase seem to take a ghoulish delight in depicting the gruesome details of the bard's death, employing a wide range of weapons and poses. This hydria by the Niobid painter of about 460 BC, now in Boston, shows one woman plunging a spear into Orpheus's thigh, while the attacker on the right grasps his hair as she prepares to decapitate him with her sickle. You can just, oops, I think it's cut off. Yeah, no, there's her sickle, right over here. And she's holding firmly onto his tresses. Despite the variations in detail, <clears throat> one element that all of these scenes have in common is Orpheus's lyre. Sometimes, as he does here, Orpheus seems to wield his instrument almost like a weapon, trying to strike out at his attackers. In others, it seems more like a shield, trying to defend himself, however ineffectually. Here, the bard has dropped his lyre on the ground in a vain attempt to deflect the skewer being driven into his neck, which he grabs with one of his hands. This example by the Villa Julia painter, dated 460 to 450 BC, and now in the Getty Villa at Malibu, also features a second attacker on the right who is about to strike Orpheus with a pickaxe. Some examples show the frenzied women wielding great boulders with which to attack Orpheus, as do the figures here on the far right and the far left of this particular vase, a stamnos attributed to the painter Hermonax, created about 440 BC and today in the Louvre. Perhaps this is an ironic illusion to Orpheus's causing the rocks to move through the power of his music. In this case, the skewer-wielding attacker places a foot on her victim, pinning him down for the kill, but at the same time also degrading him. Another element seen here, which will recur in the next few examples we'll look at, is the tattooed pattern, which is probably difficult for you to see, on the arms of the central woman. This tattooing clearly identifies the woman as a Thracian, a barbarian in Greek eyes, for no Greek man or woman would so deface their body. The tattooed Thracian woman on this Lekythos in Boston, painted in the manner of the Achilles painter, and dated about 450 to 440 BC, grasps Orpheus by the arm, perhaps preventing him from striking her with his lyre, but more likely steadying him for the thrust of the sword that she carries. You can just see the sword here. She also, by the way, has the tattooing on her forearm. This amphora by the Fiale painter of about 450, I'm sorry, 445 to 440 BC displays another Thracian woman with prominent tattoos. These are chevron shaped, advancing on Orpheus with a sword. That's a mighty sharp looking sword as well. Despite the great variety in weapons and stances of the women in these various examples, the posture of Orpheus in the majority of these examples and others that I haven't shown uh, shows really very few variations. It seems to all be sort of done according to a stock type. Orpheus typically is falling or has fallen to one knee, as he is about to here, um, reaches out with one arm to break his fall, while looking back toward his attacker and raising his lyre above his head. This basic consistency in the composition argues for a famous influential model, whether in sculpture, fresco, or panel painting, uh, we don't know, which many artists emulated, but which is lost today. And it's a well-known uh, fact that the Greek vase painters, vase painting was not considered to be a very prominent form of art. It was really sort of an artisan who did vase painting. And they often uh, derived their compositions from the more um, elevated kinds of art like uh, panel painting or fresco painting.
The curious fact about virtually all of the surviving depictions of Orpheus mesmerizing humans and being violently slain is that they represent only one of the main literary traditions about that subject, the one in which he enthralled Thracian men and was murdered by Thracian women. Depictions of important alternative narratives in the literature in which Orpheus was the inventor of the Dionysian mysteries, or conversely, that he refused to honor Dionysus and was slain by enraged menads, the female followers of Dionysus, seem to have been completely absent from ancient art, except for a few, very few, uh, rare and ambiguous allusions. A case in point is the scene on this crater by the painter of Tarquinius 707, made about 450 to 420 BC, and now in the Portland, Oregon Museum of Art, where a satyr stands behind Orpheus. While the Thracian man with his horse, a very common element in these uh, scenes, uh, faces the bard. <clears throat> this indirect reference to the mysteries of Dionysus um, may allude to the tradition I already mentioned where Orpheus is believed by some to have founded the mysteries of Dionysus and promoted his cult throughout Thracia. I'm sorry, Thrace. <laughs> um, this conflicts directly with the sort of traditional view that Orpheus, because of his descent and influence from Apollo and Calliope, um, was really a kind of a priest or certainly a proselytizing figure on behalf of Apollo. So the, the conflict between the Ap Apollonian and the Dionysian is a very strong element that arises in some of these uh, literary narratives of Orpheus's life. But if that satyr is actually a reference to Orpheus's Dionysiac connections, it's rather a veiled reference. Without a menad or a Thracian woman, no premonition of the death of Orpheus seems intended in this scene. A crater by the Curti painter, painted about 440 to 430 BC and now in Harvard's Sackler Museum, presents another puzzling conflation of narratives. Side A presents a traditional depiction of the death of Orpheus at the hands of women, not a menad, wielding a spear, presumably they're Thracian women. The second woman, by the way, the one on the right, holds a sickle, as we have seen in a couple of other vases. Side B, however, has a scene of Dionysus flanked by, on the one hand, a satyr, and on the other, by a menad, both of those figures playing music. As far as we know, this pairing of scenes, the Orphean scene on one side and the Dionysian on the other, is absolutely unique. I don't know of any other scene uh, where this kind of conflation of the two contradictory stories about Orpheus was uh, ever portrayed. Does this ambiguous presence of Dionysus on an Orphic vase refer to Orpheus as the founder of the Bacchic cult, or does it allude to Dionysus as the cause of his murder? We can't answer that question. Thus we have arrived at the fundamental paradox of Orpheus and his music, that the bard's enchanted playing and singing express an, an Apollonian ideal of cerebral and pacific music, employing the cellis or tortoiseshell lyre the noblest of all Greek instruments, music that enchants gods, mortals, beasts, and inanimate nature alike, but at the same time, music that uh, um, arouses jealousies and inflames passions, those are emotions, of course, of the Dionysian realm, which lead to terrible deeds and to the violent destruction of the very source of the music himself. This duality reflects the ambivalence that Greek society often had toward music, seeing it as a force which could exert both good and bad influences. Thank you very much.